Welcome to North Stonington Baptist Church. We're going to stand and sing hymn number 384. Hymn number 384. We'll sing the first and the last of this blessed old book. It's a well of pure water when I'm thirsty and dry, and bread when I'm hungry and worn. When the battle is raging, it's my faithful sword, a shelter from life's troubled storms. It's a light to my pathway and a lamp to my feet. When the world gets so dark, you can't see. And I've not made one change in one word that it says, but it sure made a change in me. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand is true from beginning to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it, now it keeps me from sin. When I think what it costs just to hold in my hand, it reminds me I owe a great debt to all of the martyrs who've gone to the stake and quote it with their dying breath. Now its critics are many and believers are few, but there's one thing I found to be true. If you find when you read it that there's something wrong, then there's something wrong with you. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand is true from beginning to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it, now it keeps me from sin. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this evening and for the opportunity that you give us to be here tonight in your house, Lord. And God, we thank you for Jesus Christ and the price that he paid for our sin on Calvary so long ago, Lord. And that salvation is now free for all who will come. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word that we can uh, read, we can hold, we have it in our own language, Father, and we can study it and we can know what it is that you expect of us. We pray that you'd be with us now tonight as we get started this evening, that you would speak to our hearts through your word, God, that we may know your will and that we'd be able to follow it. And uh, Father, that you would give us the, the courage and the strength that we need to do so. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Turn over to hymn number 385. Number 385, we'll sing the first, the second, and the last of The Bible Stands. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal, and they glow with the light sublime. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of man. Its truth by none ever was refuted and destroy it they never can. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands on the last. The Bible stands, every test we give it, for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it and to prove it and make it mine. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand. 
land. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. A couple of things bring to your attention. Trustees meeting Tuesday at 6.30. Wednesday, Bible study, Friday, free indeed at 7, then Saturday morning at 10 is a Sunday school outing for the teens, 6th uh, and 6th uh, through 12th uh, graders on that, and then our uh, baby dedication next Sunday at, in the morning service, and then um, the following Sunday, the 7th fellowship Sunday, potluck dinner uh, that Sunday, and the Lord's table and benevolence offering, there'll be no evening service, and then the pie and cake auction coming up. Um, as of right now, it stands that we're not doing a meal. We'll just uh, do the auction and uh, have enhance it a little bit more so we can try to make up uh, for the loss of, of the meal there. So um, that's about it for announcements. Can't think of, of anything else. <coughs> um, I'll give you an opportunity for some testimonies. I, I know it's tough with testimonies because people watching online can't hear the testimonies because it only comes through the microphone, but we'll do the best we can with it. And uh, speak really loud if you have one, so the microphone can pick you up. Anybody or don't you know, chopper? Uh, uh, the uh, old truck that's on the road. There you go. Big, big, shiny, and everything. So tomorrow I'm getting rid of that little thing. All right. Any more testimonies? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The truck up and running. Steve. We haven't had it yet. Came all together so nicely that the, the members of the team were all had great ideas and they they were polite to each other, each and every one, and how it just fell into place that everybody could do what they were supposed to do uh, as the speaker and the singers. And now we just gotta wait on the Lord to make sure that the weekend is a great weather for us. All right. Coming up on the 29th of August. Anybody else? Don? Uh, with Glenn and Grandpa. And Your Glenn, not the Glenn here. Good. Amen. So you're a great granddad. Well, I like to think the same thing about myself, but time will tell. All right. Somebody else? All right. We'll do a few favorites this week. Oh, well, I guess not. This is always that one person that wakes up and turn around, ready to go sit down before they interrupt everything.
praying for that. All right. Anybody else before we wrap it up? Let's go and do a few favorites, I guess. Come thou found. Don't mind. Richard, Nick. Steve's going to take care of the balcony. Steve's going to take care of the balcony. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this evening. Pray that you bless this offering and for the many blessings you do give us. We're grateful for and that we don't deserve, but we're grateful for them. And we continue to pray that you provide for us all that is necessary as we continue to reach out here throughout our community. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. stand once again and turn to the hymnals, hymn number 386. Hymn number 386, standing as we sing, the first, the second, and the last of thy word have I hid in my heart. <laughs>
Amen. For the scripture reading this evening, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 15. We'll read verses 17 through 20. One through six. Genesis chapter number 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we continue to ask your guidance. We look at Abraham, this, this passage where... You confirm with Abraham a covenant you made. And Father, we're grateful for the covenant you made with us, the covenant of salvation, and this great picture here of the Abrahamic covenant uh, showing us uh, the picture of salvation even in, here in our day. We're grateful for it. Pray you open our eyes to these truths. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. The reassurance of God, Genesis 1, 15, 1 through 21. We're going to look at the first part of this tonight. There are two sections to this. We're going to look at the confirmation of an heir, uh, that's where we'll spend our time tonight, hopefully get through it, uh, and then uh, follow up with a covenant about inheritance. But we're going to look at the confirmation of that. God has promised Abraham that a nation, a great nation, would come out of him. For that to happen, he has to have a child. And if you go back and look at the beginning of chapter 12 to where we are now, about 10 years has now, if you remember back, how old was Abraham when he left Ur? He was 75. So now he's about 85, which puts Sarah at 75. Now, obviously, I understand that they lived longer day, longer time in those days. And so um, we know that when he went down to Egypt that uh, Sarah had the appearance of a very beautiful woman. And so, therefore, we, we, we understand that they aged probably a little bit differently than we do now. But the... Uh, time of life or the time of bearing children doesn't seem to have changed. And so here is Sarah, now 75, and um, for all intents and purposes, uh, is beyond childbearing years. And Abraham's fully aware of this. And so he's been going through, and I just want you to, to follow me, if you will, on this, because God made a promise to him. But it seems as though the promise is going to have to be reworked somehow. And it's just like us as human beings to try to think for God. We're going to try to figure things out for God. Instead of sitting back and trusting God, we're going to try to think for him. We're going to try to figure this out because somehow or another, this slipped through God's fingers. Somehow or another, God lost track or is not able, so we're going to figure this out. This happens all the time. Churches do it. People do it. Christians do it. Uh, we see historically the nation of Israel did it. And so this becomes commonplace. It becomes common practice. In fact, it's a very common tool the devil uses. We're going to look at that. Well, let's look here first in the first verse. As we look at the confirmation of air, an air, we look at the revelation of God in verse number 1. I want you to pay close attention to this because this is really important. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I want you to realize this is the first time the phrase, the word of the Lord, came is used in Scripture. Now, it's going to be used from here on out. For all indications, this is the first time we see where God has interacted. Now, we know that God has talked to Adam and we know that God told Abraham somehow in some way that he used to leave Ur and so forth, but he, he gave Noah the, 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 uh, the plans and the, the, for, the, for the ark and all of that. But this is the first time this phrase, the word of the Lord, came. And so, again, it's not the first time God has spoken with man, 
but it's the first time it's recorded this way. It's also the first time the phrase, fear not, appears. I want you to take that because we're going to spend a little time talking about that. In this revelation of God, the first thing we notice is there is peace from God. God offers peace to Abraham. Only God can give peace. Man gives fear. We see that living out in front of our eyes. All man can produce is fear. We have a nation of people living in fear. I mean, if, if, if you're not wearing your mask and you're not wearing it properly, man, you will be berated by people. If you don't have it the second you walk in the store, there's eyes all upon you saying, well, what's wrong with this person? Does he want to kill my grandmother? I, I don't know. I don't know your grandparents. Maybe. I don't know. I've never met them. I know I didn't like mine too much, so, you know, maybe. I don't know. But it, this whole thing is just, we live in fear. And by the way, when this is over, if it ever is, there'll be another fear-mongering thing that's going to come along. Watch the commercials on TV. Just watch what they tell you. They are producing fear in everything they do. Because if we can, can, can get people fearful, we can control them. Constantly, constantly we see in Scripture, God says, fear not, take courage. I sound like the cowardly lion, don't I? When I say that, take courage. God constantly says that to us. We see this peace, fear not. Abram needed peace. Why? Well, he just came from defeating five kings in a military battle. You don't think there's going to be a little retaliation coming? You know, they're going to say, we got to get that Abraham. We can't let him show us up. I mean, the guy's never led an army before, and he defeated us, and we're, we're experienced military people. Abraham lived on nothing more than what we could consider a ranch. It would be very easy for these men to come in and attack Abraham. And don't think Abraham didn't think these things. You would, I would. God says, fear not. When we walk in God's ways, we will experience the blessing of peace, especially in difficult times. I mean, think about that. This is really relevant to us today. This is very relevant to us today. I know people get a little uh, agitated when I start talking political stuff, but, you know, it doesn't, we have to face the truth. We have a government that is trying to keep us and operate on the concept of fear constant all we hear from it's a dark winter oh we're gonna we can't oh they oh now the new thing is uh, it was since the 70s every 10 years the world's going to come to an end by some climate catastrophe whether it's the ice age or or um the ozone layer remember during the 80s was the ozone layer we couldn't use spray cans anymore because they're damaging the apparently the ozone layer is all better now and the ice age is gone and we're not going to have that then it was global warming we're going to heat up and boil to death and and now John Kerry, when he's not flying on his planes across the world, using up all the fossil fuel we're not supposed to be doing, and putting out a carbon footprint bigger than almost as big as Bill Gates, is telling us we got nine years left. That's it. Nine years. So I'm wondering if I could take a 10-year deferred mortgage that I could take out so I don't have to start paying it back for 10 years, because if it's only nine years left, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good shape. I don't have to pay my mortgage. There's always these things of fear. We got to stop it. We got to we got to stop driving cars because you know they're putting up uh, all this kind of stuff in the all the pollutions in the air. We've got to stop doing all these things. It's fear. It's all. And then they get on their jets and their yachts and their motorcades and they use more gas than most of us. They use more gas in one trip than most of us use in an entire year, maybe even a lifetime. But don't don't worry. John Kerry said his work for for climate change offsets his carbon footprint. That was his exact words. His work and effort he puts into offsets the carbon. So apparently we can work our way out of carbon footprints. Apparently like a works-based salvation. Think about that. Just let that ring in your head for a little while. When we walk in God's ways, we're walking with God, obeying God, following the word of God, doing the things God wants us to do, we will experience that peace and especially when times get difficult. Does that mean the difficult times aren't going to affect us? They most certainly are. Our people are good, are good solid, Bible-believing, 
God-fearing, God-obeying Christians getting COVID and dying? Yes, they are. But I'd like to think they weren't living in fear of it. They didn't sit shuttered up in their homes, quaking in fear. I hope nobody knocks on my door. I hope they're wearing three masks or whatever the case may be. Yeah, even my five-year-old granddaughter realized how ridiculous that is. And, and we just live and we quake in fear. We shouldn't if we're trusting God. We shouldn't. God says, fear not. You know, the only thing as a believer we need to fear is God. Nothing else. Nothing else. The second thing we get, he promises here, is not only peace of God, but protection from God, of, of the protection of God. What does he say? He says, Abraham, I am your shield. I am your shield. God's protection from the cruelty of the world around him. I am your shield. Abraham, you can't build a protective net bigger than I can give you. Abraham, there's not a shield in the world that is going to protect you from that world better than me. Don't even try. Don't expel the energy. Don't use the, the resources to try. I am your shield. We see that theme constantly through the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs. They say things like, you are my buckler and my shield. You are my high tower. In thee will I trust. We see the word keep throughout the book of Proverbs and in the, in the book of, of, of Psalms, talking about a, a, a defensive position where we are safe. That's God. God promises protection to nations. Isn't it interesting that for many, many years, our country it, it really enjoyed the protection of God. If you don't believe me, go back in the history. Go back in the history of the United States and see the protection of God upon this nation. Little things like right at the turning point of the Revolutionary War, there was a a naval attack coming in up through the Hudson River, up through uh, Hudson Bay and that area up there in, 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 uh, by Schenectady. Is it Schenectady? That's somewhere. Up there. Lake Champlain, I guess, up there, wherever that area is up there. And they were trying to, the Americans needed to get their, their, their Navy out of port. And there was no way, because there was a, as they traveled out, there were two points, and the British controlled both points, this one and that one on this side. And had they tried to get out, they would, have been, they would have been bombarded by both sides. It would have sunk the entire fleet. Mysteriously, a fog appeared. And they were able to get the entire Navy out. Same thing happened to George Washington getting off of Long Island. The whole army was trapped in Long Island. And we could go through history. We could look at the Civil War. We could look at World War I, look at World War II, how God protected this country. Because at one point, not every single person in this country was a born-again Christian. Not every church preached the gospel. Not every politician believed that God was at, but as a whole, our country followed biblical principles. We start removing those things. Boy, how many of you remember danger in school? None. Yet, when we started taking prayer out of school, we started taking the Bible out of school, we started banning Bible groups from school, we stopped giving, they stopped the Gideons from going on the school grounds and handing out Bibles and literature. All of a sudden, we're having metal detectors and all these problems in school. We're having issues in schools. We're having issues in our communities because we've, the public square, we've taken God out of it. Most of our communities used to open their, I remember that when, when, when town of Westerly, uh, decided they weren't going to open up their town meetings anymore with prayer. And I wrote a letter to each town councilman. There were seven of them at the time. Four of them got really nasty with me and wrote back and said, me basically to mind my business. All I said to them is that for historically, this country has opened every public meeting in prayer and a prayer in Jesus' name. This country is based, it, we're, not, we're, not, we're not negating that other religions are in this country, but this country was not founded upon any other religion but Christian religion. And boy, the, and this was 20 years ago. Can you imagine how bad it would be now? Most town meetings, most town things don't, public things don't open in prayer, don't acknowledge God. Don't have that. I mean, for, for years, um, every, every couple of years, there was a rotation of pastors that were asked to show up at special events here at town and open and close the meeting in prayer. I remember doing it for the, uh, was it 250th or 300th anniversary you had in this town a few years back? I can't remember. Maybe it was 200 years. I, I don't remember what it was. Um, but, you know, I was invited to come and give the prayer Memorial Day, 
parade. I was invited three or four times to come and give the, par the prayer uh, as the ceremonies began, the opening, closing. I would always pray in Jesus' name. Never was, was told to, not asked anymore. It's not done anymore. At least as far as my knowledge, it's not done anymore. We've taken God out of our community. We've taken him out of our public square. We've, 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 we, we're, we're, we're literally trying to close churches. One of the things you're going to see happen over the next few years is taking away or threatening more severely the tax-exempt status of churches, which is going to affect donations. It may not affect your donation, but it's going to affect others who give. Because a lot of people give because of that tax deduction. And so... Nations used to claim that protection. People could claim and live by, those great truth, by that protection if we live and claim the great truths of God's word. Families. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where God says that the family is protected by the believing spouse. If one of, the, if one of them is not a believer and one of them is, that the believing spouse, there's a level of protection from God over that family because of that. We, we, we can enjoy this protection from God as long as we're following and believing and, and adhering to the truths of God's word. And the last thing he says, first he says it's a peace of God and it's a protection uh, of God. And then lastly, he talks about the prize in this verse. He said, I, he said there in verse number one, I'm going to get back to where I am. He says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Most people today are only interested in the rewards of this earth, the things of this earth, the possessions of this earth. That includes Christians. We only want what we can put our hands on, the tangible things of life. We're talking about money. We're talking about possessions and things. Well, I did this for God, therefore I should get this from God. I, I, I went here and I should get this, and so on. But that's not necessarily what God's talking about here. The greatest things we can possess in this world are three things. I just want you to look, look at these and maybe list them if you're writing things down. Number one, if we can count God as our friend. That is a great possession. Number two, Christ is our Savior. No greater possession we can have in this world than Christ is our Savior. Number three, His Word in our possessions. There are a lot of places in this world they can't put their hands on the Word of God. We can. We treat it so glibly and lightly, it's amazing that we even still have it. We can have those three things. There's nothing else in this life we really need to put our hands on. If God is our friend and Christ is our Savior and our word is, His word is in our possession, we've got all we, we could ever need. But God gives us more than that, doesn't He? Much more than that. God is our exceeding great reward. And so we see the revelation of God. And let's look at the reasoning of Abraham, verses 2 and 3. He says, And Abraham said, Lord, what would thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. As I mentioned, time has elapsed, about ten years, and this time, has, is, is, there are three things that God kind of throws as a test to Abraham. Three things during this time elapsed. Remember, as I mentioned this morning, God's not bound by time. Time is irrelevant to God. It is relevant to us, but it's not to him. God can do, as we saw with, with Joshua, God can do anything he wants with time. He can make time stand still if he so desires, and he did with Joshua. And so he can, he can, as he did with some of the prophets, advance time and show them things in the future, if he so chose. <clears throat> as I said, it's been about 10 years since God made this problem, promise to Abram. As many of us would, no matter how close we are to God, no matter how spiritual we are, no matter how, how strong we are in the Word, we tend to give up hope sometimes, don't we? When we don't see things going the way we think they should. We just give up hope. Well, that was a pipe dream. And then we start to, to, to figure things out ourselves. Abraham had given hope on a child, so then he starts to think of himself, well, maybe there's, maybe God didn't really mean what he said. Maybe he meant that somebody in my household. So all I got is this servant, Eleazar. He's not even Jewish. He's from Damascus. But he's got a kid. He was born under my authority while he's been in my possession. This, this, this child was born. So maybe that's what God's referring to. Does this sound familiar? Because we rationalize these things in our mind on a regular basis with God. We all do it. I do it. You do it. We all do it. 
We begin to, to rationalize things up. Yeah, I made a commitment to, to, to faith promise, but boy, things are tough. And, 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 and you know, God, God understands if I try to find a different... You made a promise to God. I made a promise to God. And, and if you catch the, the significance of this, it's a faith promise. It's not a promise I gave, made, because I knew there was no way I was... That, that, that I would ever be able to, to not fulfill that promise because I, I've got all that right here in reserve. It's a promise I made by faith because I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to fulfill that every single time. And the first time I can't, I try to finagle things in my own way, in my own power, to be able to, to do it. God was testing, I'm sorry, I didn't give you the, God was testing it was a test by inaction. God was testing Abraham by his inaction. He was trying to figure it out himself. God's delay and fulfillment did not mean God's denial. It just meant God's delay. The devil uses God's delays to mock him. Well, did God really mean that? As he said to, to Eve, yea, did God... Yea, did have God said? The devil uses these delays to mock God, discredit his promises, and then encourage us to accept his, the devil's, shortcuts. So we see a lot of churches out there today that are not preaching salvation by faith. They're preaching salvation by many other ways. They've accepted the devil's shortcuts. We see a lot of churches out there changing their position on, on end times views, that, that maybe God, did, especially now with all that's going on, well, maybe this whole pre-trip thing, pre thing isn't the right thing. Maybe there's another one. We begin to, to rationalize in our mind and let the, let the devil begin to, in our mind, view that God's promises are compromised in some way. And then we can accept these shortcuts by, by, by the devil. And they're never really shortcuts. They just appear to be shortcuts. Delay increases the size of blessing. We need to keep that in our mind. Delay, if properly respected, can put character and muscle into our faith. We're just, we're just waiting on God. We're waiting on what God's going to do and say. Delay adds interest and dividend to the promise. For those of you that are following stock market things, it adds interest to it. It adds dividends to the promise. God's going to fulfill his promise. He will. He, we know God has never broken a promise. He will fulfill it. And sometimes that delay, that, in a, that, 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 that test of inability, that test to show us that, that, that we are not capable of doing only what God can do, as long as we endure that time with God, we will enjoy a greater blessing when it comes along. Well, then this tested by inequity. Look what he says. He says, verse, uh, verse, th uh, verse 2, he says, uh, What wilt thou go give me, seeing I go childless? And thou hast given me no seed. It is not a good practice to observe others who, in spite of the fact that they are not living for God the way we are, are experiencing blessing which we are not. It's not good to measure ourselves up against those people. Well, they don't go to church on a regular basis, and God's blessing their business, God's blessing their finances. I come every single time the doors are open. I'm not seeing that. We can't do that. We can't do that at all. We trust God. God doesn't pit us one against the other, and he doesn't measure us up against other people. We are measured up against God and Christ, and that's it. Our level of obedience to God's word. And my blessing and your blessing may not be the same. we got to be careful on these things. We see inequity on God's part. And God sees and waits for his timing to be fulfilled. We see it as God just not being fair. God says, you know what? You're just not ready. It's just not the time. God hasn't forgotten, nor does he intend to forget. 
Maybe we've forgotten some things along the way. Maybe we've forgotten some promises that we made to God. Maybe we for forgot some commitments that we were going to do. We always tend to, to look at God or the person in, in, in authority and blame them for our inadequacies. Instead of realizing that maybe there's something on my end. Maybe I created this somehow. In this case, God was testing Abraham and he was testing, God was, as we're going to see in a minute, God was doing all of this so that no way could Abraham or Sarah claim the credit for what happened. None whatsoever. There's no way Abraham could stand up and say, you know what, this was from me. They were both well past childbearing years. And yet, God did a miracle. Only God could do that. So he's, <clears throat> excuse me, tested by an action, he's tested by inequity, and lastly, he's tested by inability. He says, I go childless. He and Sarah could not produce a child, and in his inability, he was staring at him every single day. And he's right. He cannot produce a child. He is right. Every day he woke up, and there wasn't the sound of children in the home. He said, well, I'm just not able. I just can't do it. And there are a lot of Christians who struggle with this because they use this, this point, or the, not they, but the devil uses this in their life to discourage them. See, told you you couldn't do it. You just have no, you have no faith, you have no ability. This, you, this is way above, above your head. You can't do it. And they allow themselves, in a sense, to be beaten down. We live in a society and a generation of excuses. We make excuses for everything we do. Somebody else's fault, it's somebody else, there's a reason why, there's a medication for it, there's always something. There's a way for me not to face the difficulties that I have. And as a believer, I face these difficulties and if I'm enabled, which most of the times I am, it negates the ability in my life for God to step in and do the miraculous. Because I have tried to resolve this. Abraham is going to deal with this once again. And he's going to create a problem that we deal with even today. Because he took his eyes off of the promise of God and put it on his ability to find a second way of doing it. An alternative, a plan B, so to speak. In this inability, Abraham had come to believe that his heir would be the child of this Eleazar. This man who's not even of Abraham's family, not even of his bloodline. So he looked around and he said, well, maybe God meant this. And, and so many times, you know, I, I, I remember when, when we started the church 23 years ago, we made a commitment that we wouldn't go into debt. We just made that commitment. We put it in our constitution. We, we lived by that. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard pastors say, and I've, I've, I've said to young pastors, and I've been mocked by many young pastors and older pastors, Saying, listen, just wait. Wait on God. Just wait. God's got a plan. He can, he can do anything. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. No, nope, no, nope, we need to do this. And churches go into massive. And in the next few years, this is going to come back to bite a lot of churches. They're in massive amounts of debt. Massive amounts of debt. And during the good times, that's fine. But during the bad times, when the banks are starting to start getting uh, less and less profit, they're going to start looking at some of these these, these massive loans they've got out, they're going to start wanting some, some return for them. I, 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 I'm, I'm very, very concerned, very, 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 very concerned about the future of many of the churches in our country. For the amount of debt that has been racked up. To just wait on the God. Are you going to have everything you want? Maybe not. No. I remember the day we walked into that building down to Clarks Falls 23 years ago. And I thought to myself, this doesn't meet our needs. We outgrew this the second we walked in the door. But without a shadow of a doubt, I knew God was leading us there. And through 13 years of trying to figure out what God was doing, God leads, leads us here. And creates a whole new church that we're about to celebrate 10 years at.
And then as I, as I think on that, and as I contemplate what God had done, I don't think in our wildest, in my wildest dreams anyway, as pastor, I could ever imagine something like this. And be able to maintain our no debt. Now, it's been hard financial times. A few years back, we were under some hard financial struggles. And I thought to, I think to myself on a regular basis, man, I'm glad I don't have that mortgage payment to make. I look at our school, who's maintained a debt-free operation. And we're able to minister to families who, quite frankly, I don't believe anybody should be putting their children at all for any reason whatsoever in public school. For any reason whatsoever. At all. I don't want, I'm tired of the excuses of, well, they offer this academics and this athletics, whatever, whatever. What they, what they counter with in their worldly philosophies way outbalances any of the good that could ever come. That wasn't true 20 years ago. That is true right now. We just evidenced that in, a, in our election and what's going on this past summer of a, of a generation of young people who have, been, who have been infected through public education. You know, I was thinking about this. I was going to say this this morning, but I didn't want to get too many people worked up. But we all grew up thinking that Abraham, I mean, that uh, George Washington, the father of our country, was the best president that this country has ever had, that he was a great man who brought freedom to this country. Do you know what they're being taught today? He's a slave owner. He propagated white supremacy. Huge difference, isn't there? Huge difference. You know, we, you know, we were taught why the pilgrims came over here? We were taught the pilgrims came over here because they were seeking religious freedom. They were under religious persecution because of what they believed about God and salvation in particular. And so they, they left England and they went to, to Holland. They left Holland and they came over here to the new country so they could worship God as they saw fit. And if you ever read the, May, the Mayflower Compact, it's right there spelled out. Most people don't even know there was a Mayflower Compact in today's history classes. You talk to anybody that has not had Christian education or had been in the church, they have no idea what the Mayflower Compact is. And stated right in there was their purpose was to, was to establish freedom of religion. You know what they're being taught today about the pilgrims? They came over here for a way to expand slavery. And the white man's supremacy over the, over the dark man. There wasn't one word about slavery in the Mayflower Compact at all. So, you see how we can infect an entire generation? I, I do not believe that young people at all should be exposed to that in the elementary, high school, or even college, even college level. And so we get this generation of young people, of a nation, that thinks everything is revolving around them. Because everything has revolved around them. And we scratch our heads, and the churches are scratching their heads. Why can't we keep these kids in church? Why can't we get these kids committed? If you look at the young people today compared to young people 30 years ago, and there's a huge difference. 40 years ago, I was a teenager. Don Woods was my, one of my teen leaders. I built my week around going to youth group and church. Dragon, I, I, listen, I don't mean to be offensive to anybody, but we have a policy at the school that, that our kids have to be, kids and family have to be faithful to church. I have to remind parents of that on a regular basis. Hey, you made a commitment, made a commitment that you and your family would be in church. This, this, in, this inability, inability that we have, then we blame God. We blame God for it. You, hey, I go childless. God, you promise. You promise. You, hey, Abraham, hey, Abraham, have you lived up to everything you were supposed to do? Didn't you lie in Egypt? And this woman that Abraham is soon going to find out is going to be more of a problem than she's worth, that he took from Egypt, Hagar, because he didn't follow what God wanted him to do, and he got involved in worldly things and worldly ways, is going to be more of a problem to him than anything he could ever imagine. Our inability. 
We allow our obstacles to get in our way. God does not want us to glory in our abilities and our what we could do, but in our own and in our own strength. When a promise is fulfilled, happens quite often. God wants his, his abilities to be honored and for him to receive the glory. Our inability has nothing to do with God's ability to fulfill the promise. Abraham got that backwards. We get that backwards. Do we believe God can fulfill the promises? Either we do or we don't. And Abraham kind of flip-flopped that around. Well, God can't do it, so I'm going to take care of it. God hasn't forgotten. Promises are fulfilled because of the ability of God, not because of our ability. So we have religions constantly teaching salvation by works, salvation by works. I, I, I was going to mention this morning, uh, God didn't allow me the opportunity to, so I didn't, you know, we're, we're heading into, I don't know, if, I guess it's already upon us, the Lent season. It, it, it bothers me to no end that Protestant and Baptist churches celebrate Lent. How dare we? Do you even know the history of Lent? That it's not, it's not even based in a Catholic religion. A Catholic church stole it from pagan religion. And the, and, and, and the inconsistencies throughout what Lent what re re represents. First of all, find somebody who even knows what it represents. You can't. They have no idea. They, they just know it's something they're supposed to do because it adds to their salvation. That's what they think. I'm being a good Catholic. I'm being a good Christian. And these Baptist churches and these Protestant churches that celebrate it and promote it should be ashamed of themselves and have to answer to God for that. I like fish and chips as much as anybody else, but not just on Fridays. We live in a community that is heavily Catholic, so you're only going to get fish and chips on Fridays. Because you can eat fish. Apparently fish isn't meat. If you knew the reason why, you'd completely understand. We don't have time tonight to look into the reply of God, verses 4 and 5. We'll look at that next week. The, the reply, God responds to Abraham, and he responds to him in a great way. Verse number four, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, and God's going to straighten out Abraham's thinking. Have you ever had that experience? I have. I'm struggling with God about something, arguing with God about something, struggling about something in my life, and the next day or the next couple of days, I'm reading in my Bible passages I've read many times before, and all of a sudden, God speaks to me out of this, and he's using it to correct me. He's using it like, that board of education my mother used to keep in the drawer and she used to chase us around the house when we were bad. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? So my mother used to have a board about this big, about that thick, and it said right on there, board of education, we'll teach them by the seat of their pants. It's a weapon of mass destruction apparently today. If you have one of those in your house, you'd be arrested. They'd send the military in faster than they did in Iraq. But, boy, it taught us some great lessons, didn't it? Maybe your mother didn't have that, but she had something she used, or your father had something he used. My mother was anything within reach, could have been anything. A good thing that my father didn't keep any boards with nails sticking out of them. Whatever she could put her hand on, she was chasing us around the house with and smacking us on the backside with it. I went down one day and broke every single wooden spoon in my mother's little jar, except for one. She still has it. Could not snap that thing in half. And that's the one, that's the one that I should have taken down to my father's shop and cut into pieces, because that one, that was about that thick around. And that one hurt. Let me just tell you, that one hurt. And she tried chasing us around the house with that thing. My brothers and sisters weren't too happy with me because that's the, that was the go-to weapon at that point. And uh, but God teaches us by the seat of our pants sometimes, doesn't he? Not just our little ones get spanking. Sometimes we do from God. But we remember those. We remember those quite, quite vividly. We remember those lessons, don't we? Abraham's going to remember it. We'll look at that in the coming weeks. Father, we thank you this evening for this, this lesson of Abraham. We thank you that we can trust upon you. Thank you that we get peace from you, and we get protection from you, and we get rewards from you, we get prizes from you. We thank you that we are in, in able, but you're not. Help us to rely and depend upon those things. We're thankful to thee for this. Father, we live in a world that is based in just squashed by fear. Help us to rise above that. Not by being obnoxious, not by being defiant, 
but by just not being fearful and trusting in me in all that we do. And showing to the world around us that our fear is not, our, our lack of fear is not based in our strength. It's not based in our knowledge. It's based upon you and our trust in you. And watching you do the work in our lives. And we're grateful for it. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books into 126. Sing just one verse of hymn number 126. Just kidding, as we sang, I wish I had given him more. Thank you. 